Hello, this is Craig Mertens, Director of Product Education for Inktavo, the parent company of Graphics Flow, Inksoft, and Printavo. Welcome to our webcast today. Today is the third webcast in our series with our good friend Supercolor. Let's get right into it. So let's talk a little bit about the, in general, about the topic that we're working on today. And the topic is streamline your graphics process and maximize profitability. Simply put, products with better looking graphics will sell better. Today's apparel decoration marketplace has become commoditized and it really has. And graphics are such a critical component of your pricing strategy and your profitability. And um, what we're going to teach you guys today is some best practices for controlling your art development costs and streamlining your graphics workflow. And the first thing I want to talk about in the class, I want to talk about the, what we call the true cost of art development. You know, a lot of times when people get started in the industry, they don't necessarily account for their time and the amount of capital that they spend producing artwork. And I think when you f first get started, you're just excited to have some orders. And once you start, you know, doing business over a longer period of time, start looking at that bank account. One of the things that's really challenging is if you don't account for the time and expense of creating artwork, you can't really cost out your jobs and you can't really make a determination if that job was profitable or not. There's quite a few costs that go into art development. For instance, if you're having to hire a freelance graphic designer, you have all the fees that are associated with that. If you have an in-house graphic designer, there's that person's wages plus their benefits. Um, the cost of your creative tools, maybe you're paying for subscriptions for you know, the Adobe products or CorelDRAW, maybe even graphics flow. Um, the add-on costs of design and iterations. And so you know, if you're doing a revision for a client, that's more time that you're having to spend to to complete that graphic and now maybe they want a variation of that graphic and there's the time and expense involved in that and then also licensing fees for stock images including fonts and clip art and design templates things of that nature and then you have internal costs for instance maybe you're having to collaborate with folks on your marketing or sales team and you're taking up some of their time to develop the graphics as well and so also the complexity and variety of deliverables can also increase your costs and what do i mean by that getting the files prepared before your internal production process or outsourcing to an external supplier. You know, every print job requires artwork. There is variable and fixed costs with every print job and connecting variable costs to jobs can be pretty tricky. And if you track a designer's time for each order or even your own time, that ne doesn't necessarily correlate to the cost of that job. And the true cost of the designer's time is their wages and benefits divided by a number of jobs produced over a set period. So for instance, if you're paying your designer $4,000 a month and they produce 100 jobs, then your art development costs average $40 a job, which in my opinion, that'd be pretty reasonable depending upon the size of your orders. But if you're, you know, cost or if it's costing you over $100 per job, um, that's something that we're going to have to take a, a pretty hard look at. And so one of the things that I always encourage my clients to do is really account for their time in all of the human capital as well as involved in art development. And, you know, I think one of the, the big challenges that we have in the industry right now is end users don't understand what it takes to produce graphics. They just think there's some magical process and these graphics just create themselves. And they don't understand that there's human beings involved and creativity involved and that creativity and that human aspect of it has, has a cost associated with it. The better the artwork, probably the more talented the person that's building it and the more expensive they are to, to pay to do that. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit next, the advantages of having an in-house designer, and then we're going to talk about outsourcing. And, you know, I've managed art departments for the better part of 30 years. I'm, I imagine I've managed somewhere in the neighborhood between 60 and 100 different graphic designers, not only as a shop owner, but also in the business of producing graphical content for the decorated apparel industry. The nice things about having a, you know, dedicated graphic design team is, you know, they're solely focused on your needs. You know, it's not like a freelancer where you're competing for their time. They're focused on your needs and they understand your business. And it's interesting. Our um, art director, I've worked with her for over 20 years. We were just talking about this the other day. And we have, you know, this mental connection where she knows what I'm looking for. I don't really have to give her a lot of um, direction. I can kind of, you know, say, hey, this is the ultimate goal, what we want to accomplish. And she can run. And she's great about providing me feedback in the loop. But generally speaking, you know, we have a, you know, mental telepathy, I guess we would call it where we can just communicate. But when you, when you have new artists and you're getting somebody, um, that could be kind of challenging. And also the chemistry between you and the quote art department and the graphic de design department, um, is critically important. 
Also, in-house designer, you have faster turnaround time with streamlined communication and collaboration. So if you have something that comes up and you need to get an idea in front of a customer, you can sit down with that artist and say, hey, this is what we need to do. And can we pivot to this project? And also long-term relationships and consistency, kind of like when I was talking about our art director, they know it. They understand our branding. They understand our design guidelines, our specifications. Um, the other aspect of this is the increased availability allowing for immediate collaboration feedback on time sensitive projects. We know that there are going to be rush projects. And next thing I want to talk about is, you know, outsourcing, um, because that's a, you know, that's a, a pretty tricky deal. And what I mean by outsourcing, there's a variety of ways that people do it. There's dedicated companies in our industry. One of my favorite companies that does outsourcing in our industry is a company called Graphic Source. They do an absolutely phenomenal job. You can hire them on a project basis, on an individual graphic basis. And um, we have a full-time graphic designer that we employ through them. We do all of our, quote, graphic design work for our internal marketing through um, through them. That's different from our art department that's developing content. We needed a, we needed a, a decal design for a giveaway. Uh, for logo um, infographics for our marketing team. And so having access to a freelance graphic design team is, you know, for our business has been really important. All right, so taking advantage of outsourcing graphic designers, outsourcing graphic design can often be more cost-effective, especially for small and medium-sized businesses. And part of the reason for that is, you know, you can certainly staff down at your, your, your business is seasonal, um, you can use staff up using freelance. Um, and if you're really, really busy, um, you know, you have increased capacity and outsourcing provides access to a broader talent pool. So you get a lot more variety and this flexibility allows you to find a designer who really aligns with your specific brand vision and requirements. And I think about our team that does all the monthly designs for graphics flow. We're quite selective about the, the people that we hire. And, and one of the, the things that's really important to us is that they understand designing for apparel graphics, not for just general graphic design. And it's been my experience, there's a, a big difference between an apparel designer and somebody who is a graphic designer and having an understanding of how the decorated apparel industry works, how to design a t-shirt that all actually sells, is pretty important. Um, offers scalability and flexibility in your design needs. You can ramp up or down based on demand and all of your business. We talked about that a little bit. And, you know, working with multiple outsourced designers can bring a fresh perspective and creative input to your business. If you're using say, people all the time, you're going to get things that look kind of similar. You know, artists kind of have their, their groove and how they, you know, prefer to work and their style and, you know, being able to get a little bit of the spice of life and hiring different people, you can get into different styles of work um, that really benefit your customer. Um, so deciding between in-house and outsourced graphic design, you know, that's a, that's a tough decision to make. And ultimately, you know, outsourcing versus hiring a full designer is going to really depend on the specific needs of your business. Do you, are you backed up? Do you have enough, you know, need for a full-time person? You know, what's your budget? Um, long-term goals. And a lot of times people end up doing the art themselves. So if you're a small kind of a one or two person operation, a lot of times you'll, you know, wear all the hats in the company, including the graphics. And that's where it becomes really challenging because you know, every second you have buried in the computer working on graphics is also time you're not spending doing things that are proactive in your business that are bringing revenue in. And I, I've, I'm seeing today, you know, most businesses are focusing on a hybrid approach. They might have an in, in-house person or their the the owner operator is doing the graphic design and they're freelancing. And typically they'll freelance on things that are, you know, outside their scope or menial things like cleaning up logos or digitizing embroidery. Um, so that gives you the benefit of, of both worlds of outsourcing and having an in-house person. And it's important to evaluate your priorities, you know, your budgetary constraints, the, the skill set re required for your design projects. If you're brand new to graphics, you know, I've been do doing graphics for 30 years. I have a good skill set. I can draw, I can produce cool looking t-shirt graphics, but I spent a lot of time learning those skills. Um, but you know, it's, it's great to have those skills, but it is quite a learning curve. And so, you know, looking at maybe prioritizing your efforts into other areas of your business versus doing graphic design might be in, in the best interest of your long-term profitability. So one of the things that I want to talk about, which is really important now you've, you've, you know, you've figured out what your strategy for our work is. Maybe you're, you're doing it in house, you're doing it yourself, or you have a graphic designer or you're freelancing, but setting expectations with your clients about art development 
is critically important. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes people make. And thinking about our time, you know, running a collegiate sportswear company, that was our family business and dealing with 30 reps. And we had 26 people in our art department, pretty big, big company doing collegiate sportswear. You know, the things I'm going to talk about right here, I wish were things that we had done a better job with our shop. And I think if we had done a better job with that, I think we would have had uh, more success. And it was a very successful business, but the artwork was always one of the biggest challenges in our company because we're doing collegiate sportswear and we'd have 50 or 60 collegiate graphics per year. And we had 6,000 customers and 30 sales reps. Can you imagine all the very variations? And so the first thing I'm going to talk about is start out by clearly defining the standard of your work and the quality that your business provides. Your customers are automatically going to, by default, think that everybody does the same level of work in our work. And that's not true. And so that's where getting a portfolio of your work and showing examples of the kind of level of work that you're doing to your customer it is really important and it sets expectations and it also differentiates you from the other people that are doing roughly the same things. And, you know, be transparent, you know, schedule a consultation with your customer, discuss their requirements, preferences and budget and budget kind of assumes that there's going to be some fees and charges involved in especially doing custom art development. And, and I can't tell you to, if you should be charging or not, uh, you know, it really depends upon the scope and size of the project and how much, you know, how, how much it's going to cost you out of your pocket in terms of, of labor. But most people are charging for custom art development in today's marketplace. And if they're not, that's because they have a, uh, there's reorder potential or the minimum order quantity is large enough to absorb it. But if you're doing custom art development, and you're spending two hours on a design and it's going to be for a one-off, you're losing quite a bit of money on that project. So, you know, having that kind of money discussion with and being transparent upfront with the customer, I think is really smart. Uh, provide a detailed estimate and quote that outlines the costs involved in the creative process. And this is where I like to talk about getting it, what we call an upfront contract with your customer. What is an upfront contract? When you're working with them, you say, hey, listen, we're going to do this art development for you. Um, whether you're charging for it or you're doing it, you know, on a spec basis, you know, the expectation needs to be set that, hey, if you like what you see, you're buying it for me. You can't take this artwork that I've developed for you and take it to another vendor. I own the, the copyrights. I know it has your logo in it, but I own actually the copyrights to this specific piece of work. And we're not doing this artwork for free. So you can go and shop it around to other vendors and you shouldn't have to say that. But unfortunately you do. And I think every apparel, decor has, or apparel decorator has a story that you know involves a customer taking their art and shopping it to another vendor and i've actually talked to vendors that that have told me hey listen if somebody comes to me with art that somebody else developed we just won't do the printing we're doing we don't want to risk all the copyright stuff and the drama and it's you know the ethics of the whole thing and we don't like it when other people do it to us so we don't do it to them but believe me there's plenty of people that just don't share that same level of ethics and be happy just to copy other people's work um, educate your clients about the creative process and the steps involved in developing custom art, customer, custom artwork. So for instance, letting them know a human being has to make the drawing of their wrecking crane that's going on the front of their, their shirt. They want this really fancy NASCAR looking illustration of a wrecking crane. And somebody's going to have to draw that. We haven't gotten to the point with artificial intelligence yet, where we can, we can replace an illustrator. Um, the AI programs can do some pretty neat things with photography, but I haven't seen one that can draw yet. Maybe you guys have seen something along that line. I keep looking. Um, and then clearly communicate the expected timeline for the creative process, including milestones. Give them an idea as to what it's going to take. And I had a customer of mine that, that, that shared something with me and I thought it was interesting. He said, you know, when he's working with a client, he, he says, hey, listen, there's two ways we can do this. We, number one, I'm going to do custom art development. I'm going to need you know, five to 10 days to do it plus time for revisions. You know, we charge an average of $50 an hour. There's a two hour minimum. So it's a hundred dollar minimum. And then $50 after that, we include a revision and that's how we do it. And he gives them the absolute specifics of what, what they're in for. Then he gives them an alternative and he says, Hey, listen, or, you know, we have thousands of stock designs. And if you select my stock, designs, I'll go and work my magic and turn it into something spectacular for you. And I can get something back to you within 24 hours and then there's no R charges. And which route do you think they go? They always go with the, <laughs> the, the stock art option, um, unless they have a budget and time to, to, you know, you know, execute a, you know, customer art development plan. Um, and discuss the number of re re revisions that you're going to you know, include with the art. You know, I've worked with clients back in the shop days and at a client, um, wonderful uh, woman, I just found out she was nice, six years old. 
I, for some reason, I just looked her up um, to find out what happened. Because remind twenty five, almost thirty years ago. My wife said it was twenty seven years ago, and she just passed away in in uh, in uh, in February, ninety six years old. And she would have me jumping through hoops. She was really talented, and she had the purse strings of a very large account. But she would make me jump through hoops, and I would always expect to have two or three you know revisions on any graphic that we developed together. Now, the, co the cool part about that particular relationship, because she was so engaged in the creative process, I had her completely locked in because she was, can you do this? Can you do that? I don't like this, I like this. Um, it just locked her in because she was involved in that creative process. So it's kind of a double-edged sword in, in a sense. But I think it's important to talk to clients about revisions that I can't keep doing revisions over and over again. I'll give you one for free, but you know, after that, we're going to have to charge you for our time. And you know, share your portfolio of previous work and any positive testimonials you, you have from your clients. One of the things that you should be doing, always collect testimonials from your customers. And so, you know, there's nothing in my opinion better in terms of credibility than having, you know, another person in a similar line of work or a similar business say, hey, listen, I did these with these folks and they did a great job and I was really happy and pleased with the level of quality and the artwork. And I would recommend them 100%. And while you're at it, can you go and put that same review on Facebook and, and on Google for me as well. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is implementing a common sense approach to proofing and art approval. So we've set the expectation with the client. We're working on developing the artwork. We're in that process. And now we need to collaborate with them to get the ideas finalized and move into production. And I cringe when I talk to customers that don't have a proofing or art approval process. It just, you know, it's a recipe for having a lot of merchandise being sold at the local swap meet or being donated <laughs> to your local Goodwill. Because if you don't have a proofing and art approval process, you're just opening yourself up to mistakes and unhappy customers. And, you know, maybe, maybe your customers will give you more than one chance, but I've found it personally in my experience that, you know, if you mess up their first order, the chances of you getting a second one are pretty low. So it's just a really good idea to have some form of proofing and art approval process. And I'm going to talk about some of the reasons that we want to do that. So number one, it ensures that the final artwork meets the desired quality and standards. So when we get the artwork finalized, it, it's up to their expectations. It's what they thought they were getting. So there's no discrepancy between what the final artwork was and what the final product is. They're like, yep, this is what I wanted. And if it's not what they want, then we have a chance to correct it. Uh, preventing errors, inconsistencies, or misunderstandings. I told you that we wanted to do it this way, and then you didn't do it this way. Well, if you don't have to sign off on a proof, then you know you don't. I don't think you really have any recourse. And this concept of kind of fire and forget on artwork is is not even if your logo, even if all I'm doing is reproducing my your logo, I'm still going to have you do a proof because I want to make sure that, I want to make sure the placement is correct and the colors are correct that there wasn't any kind of distortions of the artwork or it's exactly what you expect. And, you know, we want the, the final product to align with the client's expectations and requirements. You know, they are getting what they asked for. Um, and also, you know, it increases your customer satisfaction because they feel in, in, you know, involved and they're, they're confident in the outcome. They, they see that you care and that you're professional and that you're going through this process to make sure everything is done as planned. And it gives the customer greater confidence level when you're doing that. It's kind of like when you go in to get your car fixed and you're talking to the mechanic and, you know, everybody's always really sensitive about that, but they break down all the problems with the vehicle, what needs to be replaced and the costs involved in all that and what your options. You can let this go, but maybe you shouldn't. Um, you can maybe skimp a little bit here and let this go a little bit longer, but you really need to take care of, of this part. I always feel good when I'm talking to a mechanic and they're, they're, you know, they have that full transparency, so I know what I'm getting into. And I think working with clients on artwork is the same thing. And minimizing the chances of mistakes and reducing the risks of financial loss. Um, there is a technical word for when the artwork does not get done correctly and the products get shipped and delivered to an unhappy customer. And the technical word for that is called a bummer. That is a bummer <laughs> because who's going to, quote, absorb that cost? You know who's going to absorb it? You are. And even if there's a partial blame involved in that and partly the customer and partly you, um, now all of a sudden you're in a, you know, uh, in conflict with the client and it damages the relationship and you might not do business with them. And that, you know, in a sense that you can, that, that's something that's easily avoidable by having a, a proofing and art approval process. 
facilitates effective communication between the business and the graphic designer and the client. So, you know, it's just a professional thing. Everybody should be doing it. Everybody should have some form of proofing and art approval process. And I'm going to show you some ideas and some different techniques that people utilize to, to do proofing and art approvals. This, which is, you know, where, where does, you know, graphics flow, the company that's sponsoring this event, where to kind of, we fit into this. And so we're kind of the in between a full-time graphic designer and freelancer, because what we've done is we've created a system that allows anybody on your staff to produce graphics without an in-house design team or outsourcing doesn't require a professional graphics program dramatically reduces our production time, increases your turn turnaround time, reduces the need for revisions, uh, reduces production time. You can respond very quickly. You control both the sales and art development process process, and it makes it easier for clients to buy from you. So I don't really want to get into a whole lot about that because I want to show you, I want to show you like a typical process. Somebody would develop artwork and how you would proof it. And I'll show you three different proofing systems and how we, we do proofing. And then I'll show you how we would pre prep that artwork for a um, outsourcing uh, transfer to Supercolor and some of the things that we'd have to go in, go through to do that. So let's get into it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm in my Graphics Flow account right here. So Graphics Flow is an online app. And when you first load up graphics flow, one of the things that you're going to see is literally thousands of ready-made design templates. There's just a lot going on here and have designs for anything. And one of the things that I always like to kind of share with clients is like, don't get fixated on the subject matter. What you really need to be concerned about is the, the style because any design can be easily adapted. And one of the things that I did this week, we do, I do a little video every month when we come out with the new design drops. And in that video, what I'll do is I'll show examples of, you know, what artwork look, looks like that's been adapted. And one of the, the, the things that to me, that's always really interesting is, you know, you have a concept and an idea of, of one thing. And by the time you get done with it, it's, it's something completely different. And the, the idea, you know, has a tendency to kind of grow on its own. So these are all the different variations of a design, but this design started out as a softball design. And then I just made all these different variations of that graphic. And the way I did that is I'll show you kind of how I did that is I went over here, I was in design ideas and I had a vision for a graphic that I wanted to use that was going to be athletic in nature. It's fairly colorful. I wanted to do a transfer. And so I did some, I, first of all, I went to style and I just went and looked at athletic designs. And so I just wanted to see just a general athletic design because I knew I was going to do a baseball design, but I wanted to see if, you know, something would catch my eye. And we had a lot of options in here. And so I went and looked in there. I found quite a few things that I thought would work. Um, but then I said, hey, listen, why don't I just look at softball? I looked at baseball. And why don't I just look at softball? And maybe there's a softball design I can morph into baseball. And I was like, yep, sure is. So I just picked this one right here. So I found this little softball design and I was pretty easy to customize. So I said, let's customize it. So I went over here and clicked on customize. So this, what we're doing right now is we're editing on the native Adobe Illustrator file. There's two versions of this file. There's a file that was created in CurlDraw and there's a file that's created in Illustrator. And I'm, I'm editing on the native vector artwork for that, those two files. I'm actually editing the file as it was created in Adobe Illustrator. And so what you'll see over here on the right hand side, you'll see a little editing panel and I can go over here if I want to and make changes. So I'll change that to 2023 and where it says softball, I'm going to change that to baseball. So we'll go over here, change that to baseball, hit enter. And this is a two layer text effect. I need to change the word baseball twice because there's a white drop shadow behind there. And then where it says Eagles, I'm going to change that to Cougars Hit enter. Again, it's a two layer effect here. Cougars, hit enter. And let's see here. I think the copy is good. Um, clip art. So maybe I don't want the ribbon, so I could turn the ribbon off, see what it looks like without the ribbon. And it looks fine without the ribbon, but I think the ribbon helps. So I'm going to turn the ribbon on. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to go over here to the little eagle. And I'm going to click on edit and we're going to pull up a new eagle. And so we're going to do that from the massive library 
of production ready vector clip art that's in graphics flow. So I'm going to say replace clip art. I'm going to type in the word cougar. Let me hit enter. And I'm going to scroll down until I find the cougar I want. And I'm just going to click on it. And the cougar is going to pop in here. And I'm going to hit apply. And then what I'm going to do is maybe make the cougar just a little bit bigger. So make it a little bit bigger and move it over a little bit. So I'm just going to move it to the left a little bit. It looks pretty good. So we'll just nudge it. So what's going on is we're actually manipulating this graphic on a server and then we're just updating the previews live. And that's why we're able to, to work on these complex vector graphics. And the thing I think it would be smart to do before we get in and completely recolor this is actually consolidate some of the colors in the clip art first. So I'm going to click on that color and I'm going to consolidate that to that kind of burgundy color right there. And I'm going to take this color and make it white. And then I'm going to take this color and make it white. And then I'm going to hit apply. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, that looks good. Let's, I'm going to recolor this based on the colors that I want for the design. And I'm going to set this up for an ash colored shirt. So we're going to do a little tweaking here. So I'm going to take this outline right here on the word cougars. So there's a, a layer there. And I'm going to take that outline. I'm going to make that kind of a navy blue. So we're going to go over in here and I'm going to select navy. So what I'm basically doing is kind of reversing some of these colors out. And then the burgundy color in here, I'm going to change that to, I think I can change that to white. Looks good. And I'm going to hit apply to that. And then on the other color layer, what I'm going to do is change this one, the outline, to a red. So I'm just kind of getting the colors for this dialed in, so to speak. So we're dialing in the colors. And these colors are now utilized in the design. So really the only thing left to do is just kind of consolidate the rest of the colors to line up with this. So I'm going to take all of the gold. Let's see, I'm going to take all the burgundy and we're going to make that red. Looking good. And then I'm going to take all of the gold and consolidate that to blue. Got that. And, you know, if it was baseball, you can make that a fluorescent green. I mean, excuse me, if it was softball, you can make that fluorescent green. But I think what I'm going to do with that particular object is just drop some gray in there. So I'm going to go to this color and just use kind of a silvery gray, which should look pretty good. And it applies. So I've created my design, I think, on the kind of looks like the so-called beard on the cougar. I think that needs to be white because cougars don't have beards. I don't think that whiskers, though. And let's save design. So we've got this design. This design, I could just send this design off to Supercolor. I wouldn't really have to do anything. Um, it's it's ready to go. But we're going to come back to it. And I'll show you just kind of some things that connect with the Supercolor art standards um, and we'll kind of explain how that works. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to save this design. And I'm going to save this design into a folder in my Graphics Flow account. And Graphics Flow is going to be great because it's going to go in and create, um, I think I'm going to put this in BTS designs. It's going to create previews for all these files. So I'm going to save it. And I'm going to download two versions of the file. I'm going to download a PNG version of the file right here. And I'm just going to put that in, I'm going to put that up on my desktop. We'll just call it Cougars Baseball 01. Actually, I probably have an 01 already. So PNG file is a bitmap file that has um, the, the bitmap file. But it's not composed of vector artwork, so it's not real super easy to recolor, but it's great for like virtual samples. It's wonderful for, you know, loading up a web store, or social media, all that kind of stuff. But the production file, I'm either going to download it as a CDR file if I'm working with CorelDRAW or if I'm working with Illustrator, Affinity Express or Inkscape or the Inksoft Designer, or these kind of programs, I would download a PDF file. So we're going to go ahead and download the PDF file. And we're going to come back, we're going to use these files a little bit later. So we're going to call that Cougar Softball 04, because it looks like I already had an 03 in there. Okay. So I've just taken an extra step to download these production files. 
But what I need to do now is I need to get this in front of the customer. So this is where proofing comes into play. And so, you know, in a scenario like this, one of the things that we could be doing is just getting a few ideas, being proactive and just getting a few ideas in front of the customer. You know, they, we know that they do their back to school purchasing. We know the the coach or the, the parent sponsor or the, the head of the booster club. And we just want to get a few ideas in front of them. And what better way to do that than localizing a few designs um, that are connected with their team, Cougars Baseball. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this to an art approval. I'm just going to go over here and add it to an art approval. I'm going to create a new art approval. And what this is doing is creating a web page. And we'll call this Cougars Baseball Boosters right there. So that design has been added to a web page that was just built. It's an art approval. Then I can share that art approval with the client. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that art approval. And then what I can do is I could, if I wanted to, I could add some additional designs. So I have quite a few different Cougar designs I've created. So I could come over here. And if I was doing this as a prospecting campaign, I might add a few more designs to this. So I could go to the plus button and I could ask, add some additional baseball designs. I could come in here and just say, hey, Let's see what other baseball designs I want to add to that. So I could do that and add another design. Or maybe I have designs that I've already uploaded and maybe even last year's design so they can take a look at a design that we did last year. And so I'm going to go to my back to school designs. I'm sure I've got another Cougars design in here. Probably have a different variation of this in here, which I do. And I could add the variation that we did for navy blue shirts possibly. There you go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change up the colors here. So I'm going to click on the background and in the graphics flow platform, I can go in and change the background color. So we'll change this to kind of a navy blue color and a little bit deeper. There we go. And then on the other one, I'm going to change this one. Actually, that's not quite navy. I could put the RGB values in there too, if I knew it. Here we go. There's navy blue. And then the other one, I think we talked about doing that on an ash gray or possibly an Oxford. So I'm going to go over here, click on that. And we're going to put this on kind of a Oxford ish color gray right there. Let's see what, yeah, it looks great. So this is what I want to share with the customer. So two, two kind of use cases here. Use case one, I'm just trying to narrow the artwork down um, for the client so then we can go to a quotation phase. And use case number number two is, hey, this is it. This is the art. I need you to sign off the art, the art so we can start production. And how you're going to share this design is going to be dictated by that. And I'm going to go ahead and move the gray one to the top there. And the way you would share this design is you would go over here to share and in the art approval function in graphics, so you'd say invite, and you can either put the customer's email address here and email through our system, or you can grab a link. And there's three types of links. There's a view only link. If we send out the view only link, nobody can comment, nobody can approve. We can send this link out to, you know, a whole group of people that were prospecting, maybe all the coaches and booster people within my local com community. Nobody can see what else is going on. I can also send out a commenting link where anybody that has a link has to enter their email and they can comment, or I can do a comment and approval link. And what I'm going to do is a comment and approval link real quick here. And I'm going to copy that link and then I can put that into an email, send it to the person that is making the ultimate decision. They click on the link and then guess what? They're looking at the same artwork. They can put a comment in if they didn't like something, they could say, Hey, I'm not crazy about the, the gray. About the dark gray. Can you do ash? And when they send that, I'm going to get an email and I'm also going to get notified in the app. And all that communication is going to be in this document. It's on this web page. It's not like this back and forth email communication thing where you have to decipher, you know, what was the last one we decided? <laughs> the truth for this design is this web page. And I'm going to go and say, sure thing, refresh your browser. If they're logged into the page, they're going to see this. <laughs> and 
if they're not, they're going to get an email that says with a link to go and read my comment. And so over here, we're going to go to the design and I'm going to lighten up the back. On all our so I'm going to go in here and we're going to lighten it up to more of an ash. And the customer's happy. And hopefully they're going to sign off. All right, there we go. Kind of an ash gray. And so when they go to sign off, they have to, on this one, they have to sign off on two of these. So they have to sign off on the first one. They're going to approve it. They could reject it as well. They have to approve it. And they can put any conditional notes in here. And they're going to go over here and approve that. And they can put any conditional notes in here just to confirm. We are doing Oxford Gray. You guys see what I did there, right? They have to click through your disclaimer and the disclaimer can say anything you want, but this is kind of our boilerplate disclaimer that we use. And we say all designs represented in this rule are the intellectual property of Craig's creations. You're not permitted to take the artwork we create to other vendors and our, our use of these designs is a violation of international copyright law. And by the way, colors on the screen are going to look different than the final product. That's what that says. So they're being required to click through their disclaimer. They're approving this. And this now becomes an approved art approval. It's date and time stamped. And if I need to resend it to them and say, hey, you signed off on this on such and such a date, I can just go back and resend it to them. Or if they still have the original link, they can link, they can link to it, but it's locked. They can't comment anymore. It's, it's, it's a locked art approval. And then at that point, what I would do is I'd go back to my art approvals and I might archive this. I see it's approved. And then I would just go and put it in my archive. And if they come back and they said, hey, you know, we we wanted this on ash and i said hey listen in your art approval you said oxford it's in the comments you know but we're going to do it on ash and i can i could catch that discrepancy because when they go to place the order i could have seen the note and said hey listen you said oxford on the art approval but on the order now you're saying ash which one is it and so it's a really good clue because all the comments are are still in here and i can go read the comments and I can send the comments back to them just by sending the link again and they can review all the comments. So it's a really nice fail safe. And you notice there's no product that's associated with this. So this is purely an art approval signing off the, on the artwork. There's some benefits to that too, because you know, now you're not really having a pricing conversation with them. You're just getting them hooked on the artwork and then you go to phase two. So this is a, a definitely a style of an art approval. Let me show you another style and a way of doing it. And this is the way a lot of folks do it. And I'm going to use Printavo, our sister company, and I'm going to use an art approval in the form of a quote to show you how we would set up a quote and include the art approval in that. And we'll do a little virtual sample with that. So I'm logged into my Printavo account. Printavo is a very powerful job and shop management software, and it can schedule all my jobs, quotations, it's got production calendars, CRM, does all my invoicing. I can set up a quick little web page. The customers can go into order and so it's got a, an e-commerce capability and it's a, a software that thousands of apparel decorators use to run their shop and one of the fundamental features of printavo is a quote and so if i want to go over here and create a quote i'm going to say quote so i'm just going to create my quote new quote i'm going to select a customer and in my demo account i only have two people so it's either going to be greg or john doe i like greg a little better and we're going to scroll down here and we're going to pick the decoration style. So I'm just going to, in this case, I'm just going to click on screen printing. It could be, uh, I could put a category in there for heat transfer as well. If I'm doing a suit color transfer under item, I'm going to search for a golden 2000 shirt. And I think I was going to do ash gray. So, um, ash, this is from SNS. So I could pick a different vendor too. So golden 2000 ash ultra cotton, um, from SNS, I could pick a, a Samar if I wanted to. And then I'm just going to put my quantities in here and we'll do the old 12, 24. Ooh, that'd be a nice order, 224, 24, 12, and maybe six doubles. And I'm going to go and put my pricing in here. Now I'd probably put a, I'm going to get rid of the doubles because I'd put that on a different line and then I would charge more for it. So I'm just going to put in a price here of 850 and we're going to enter that in there, but I don't have any artwork connected to this job yet. So this is just blank product. So what I want to do is I want to add an imprint and the imprint I'm going to add in this case is going to be a screen print. And so I'm just going to say type of work. We'll call it screen printing. Again, I could put in transfer there if I wanted to 
and we're going to add that imprint. So now we know what the imprinting is. And so now we can create a mock-up and upload the artwork, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go to what's called the mock-up creator. And we're going to create a mock-up based on that golden t-shirt. So it's pulled in the product photography from the golden t-shirt. And what I need to do is add a design. You remember that PNG file? So let's go and grab it from my desktop here. There we go. And so now I'm just adding the artwork. Remember, this is the version of the artwork that I did for Navy Blue. So we're going to click on Upload. One of the things I can do on here, I can actually remove a color. So if I wanted to take a color and actually erase a color, I could just click on the eraser tool and I could take all the white out. I don't want to do that because I think it looks good with the white. But um, we could take the white out and have like the garment color show through where the, the cougar was. But I like this. I think it looks good. We'll get it all placed over here. And I can save the mock-up. So we're going to save the mock-up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our quote. So here's our quote. And you'll notice now the artwork and the mock-ups attached to the quote. The artwork is attached to the quote plus the mock-up here. I'm going to hit save and finish. And then when I want to zip this over to my customer, all I got to do is just go to messages. And then I'm going to put their emailers, Greg's email right here. I'll put my email in there. <laughs> And we'll call this, I'm just going to go and select a template for artwork approval right here. And it'll put the invoice number on it to automatically. And I'll put the customer's name in there and I'll just send it. And I can send a copy to myself too. So we're just going to send that. So there's a preview of what was sent. And then if I go back to my email, I'm going to get an email that says, Hey, listen, here's the art approval for this quote. And it'll have a link in it that's going to enable me to go in and go back to the quote and sign off. Then I just click on this, go back to the quote, customer goes in, signs off, and we're done. And so that's a, a and they could download a PDF of that as well. So that's another way of doing art approval utilizing the quotation system. And I think it's a pretty, pretty terrific way to do it. Very professional, very streamlined, and very quick. And at this point, once they approve, what we're going to do is we're going to move this into a production cycle, get it scheduled. And we're going to, you know, if this is a heat transfer and I only have so much capacity on my press, we're going to say, hey, this job is, what is it, 72 units. I can press one shirt. We'll just say a shirt every 30 seconds. I will say a shirt a minute. So I need an hour and 12 minutes. I'll put that into my schedule and we'll book all of our time up. We we'll probably might book a, a buffer on that as well. So I would go in and schedule it, add it to my schedule, um, and put it into power scheduler. And that'll link to my calendar so I can see all my jobs. So this is professional job management. So that's one way of doing a proof. I'll show you another way of doing a proof. And the way I'm going to do this proof is I'm going to use Inksoft, our other sister company, and I'm going to create what's called a proposal. And what you're seeing on the screen right now, this is a web store. And this particular web store is um, branded to Central Cougars. It's got their colors. I've got all kinds of fun products in here that I've created. And I've used this quite a bit. It's got some pretty cool stuff in here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a proposal that's linked to this store. And so if I go into proposals and I create a new proposal, one of the first things I want to do is connect it to a person that's associated with this proposal. And that would be, of course, Greg Martinez. And so I'm going to go into my proposals feature in Inksoft. And Inksoft is uh, is primarily in a very powerful e-commerce platform, but it also has incredibly powerful functions for sales and marketing proposals. It has an online designer, so the customer can go design their own merch. But it works beautifully with graphics flow, and so does um, Printavo. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to create a new proposal and I'm going to pick out my good friend, Greg. And Greg is probably already associated with this store. Let's see if Greg's associated with this store already. No, Greg's associated with a different store. So I will pick out, I'm just going to pick out Greg. And then I haven't associated with him this, this store. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate him with this store. I'm going to go over here and say, he's associated with Central High Boosters. 
where that's important is it's now it's going to pull in on the logo, all the billing information, all the colors from that store and match it to the proposal. So I'm going to call the proposal central high baseball boosters right here. I can put a PO number in here. I can put a expiration date on here of let's say June 23rd in hand state of July 5th. So we'll go over here and having an expiration date on a proposal is actually not a bad idea. Uh, under payment details, I'll let him pay by he can prepay, but I can also change it to um, deposit required or no deposit required. Balance due date in uh, days from approval, 10 days from approving it. So I've got this all set up. I'm going to save this proposal. And then I'm going to add some art. Now, I already added art. That, that design is already in this design right here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to add product. And I'm going to select a product that I'd like to, to produce this on. And we're going to go down here. This is called Rapid Product Creator. So I've got all the popular blank products that I do all the time um, are here. I've just curated my blank products so that they're, they're in my Rapid Product Creator. But I could also go in and select a product that I already pre-decorated. So if I already have something that I've done before and I just want to add it to the proposal, let's say it was like, you know, like a reorder or whatever, I could do that as well. And so let's see, we'll just add this t-shirt right here. And I'll hit next. Ooh, I can add it in Navy too. I'll add it in Navy. And it's automatically going to create the, the two different versions based on the colorways I set up. And I'll put the quote in here. And I'm just going to make this 12 extra large and 12 extra large right there. And I'm going to add that to a proposal. And so there's our little proposal. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it to the customer. So first I want to save it. And then I want to send it to the customer. So I can send it as an, a, an approval right here. And it's going to go to this fictitious email address. So I don't want it to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the customer is going to see. I'm going to go over here to customer view. I'm going to say preview as approval. Right here. They're going to get a link to view this. They can go and view the proposal. They can approve the art. They want to see closer details on the art. They can do that in the virtual sample there. So they can see what's going on, make sure everything's exactly to their expectations. They're going to click on approve and have to put their name in here and it'll do a signature there. There you go. Submit approval. So now it's been approved. And then the next part, which is the really exciting part is I could set this up so they're required to pay now. Now, I didn't put a payment requirement in there, but if I'd put in payment in full, they would have been prompted to put their credit card information in at this point. So that's a, an alternative way of creating a proposal utilizing the, the functionality of, of Graphics Flow. Now, interesting enough, um, the customer also has what's called their end user portal, and I have to Let's see, I have to log out to, to show you guys what that looks like. And so the customer has an ability to go in and view all of their, their everything that they've been working on. And so they have their own little portal. And so let me log out and I'll log into my end user portal. So this is kind of simulating what the customer's experience would be. And... So we're going to sign in as an end user. And this is the portal where they can go to their account and they can view all their proposals. They can view their quotes and invoices, all the artwork that's associated with their account. If they want to reorder, they can just go in here if they choose to, and they can just place a reorder. So this, the whole other aspect, a lot of times people kind of focus on Inksoft as an e-commerce platform, but it's, it's a lot more than, than e-commerce. So there you go. All right. So last but not least, I do want to kind of go over quickly the art specs for Supercolor. And we're going to do a whole dedicated class just on that. 
but they just came out with a new set of kind of artwork recommendations and people get kind of confused about this stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about what all this means. And so this is the artwork specifications, kind of the streamlined version that the super colors come out. And so what they're talking about using CMYK color mode is RGB colors are designed for screen. They're not designed for print. Doesn't mean you can't print RGB colors, but it's a different color gamut. And the digital offset printer that they're utilizing to print colors requires CMYK colors. Now, one of the things that they do that's important is they have the ability to match colors that are Pantone colors. And, but it can't be a custom spot color. It has to be a numbered Pantone color. So if you're using, for instance, 289 blue and you're, you know, setting up that file and you tell them 289 blue Pantone, they can color match that. So the colors either need to be CMYK or they need to be Pantone, um, Pantone spot colors that are numbered. So that's the most important thing. Avoid thin lines. So in direct to film printing, if you have lines below 0.2 millimeters or below a point, the printer's not able to underbase under those and you're not able to carry that detail. And so having really, you know, thin lines that are sitting off in space by themselves is problematic. You can have thin lines if they're on top of another color, like over here, you can get away with that, but just sitting off into space, really thin lines under 0.2 millimeters is going to be a problem. And one of the things they're also talking about is opacity. They, they don't want to have like blended radiant gradient, like blurry drop shadows around things, because we have to put an underbase of white on, on top of this color. And there's no way to underbase these fuzzy edges and things. So they want to have full opacity. If you have a drop shadow, it's got to be a solid gray drop shadow. It can't be one of these fuzzy kind of photographic gradient type drop shadows. Really important. Uh, vector specifics. If you have text in your design, it has to be converted to curves. So text, if you can still type it, is still text. In Adobe Illustrator, you'd call it converting to outlines. In CorelDRAW, you'd call it converting to curves. And that text has to be converted to curves because you can get font substitution. So if the text is still live in the graphic and you're not supplying the fonts with the graphic, when they go to open it up in their software, say Illustrator, or Corel, or Photoshop, they're gonna get a message that says, hey, listen, the font is missing. Would you like to substitute this with a super ugly font that the customer doesn't want? No, they don't. So by converting text to curves in your graphics program, it's no longer editable as text, but it eliminates the risk of that font getting substituted. Um, they're talking about embedding linked images. This is really an Illustrator Photoshop thing. So in Illustrator Photoshop, you can have like a logo in a folder. And instead of having that actually in the graphic, you can create a placeholder in Illustrator that goes back and pulls a preview of that logo into your, your graphic. The problem is when you save the graphic, the logo's broken, it's, it's not there. So in Illustrator or Photoshop, what you need to do is you need to go in and, and break the link between the embed and actually embed the logo into the graphic itself. So instead of having it be linked, it's actually embedded into the graphic. It's actually part of the graphic. And that's kind of an unusual thing. Most people don't do it that way, but it does, does come up. So um, having linked graphics is, is a big no-no. Uh, remove custom spot colors. So if you've created colors yourself and they're custom spot colors and you mixed up this color and, and converted it to spot, um, that's that's not going to work. So you need to have either CMYK colors like we talked about, or you need to have colors that are already coded, you know, spot colors like Pantones that already have the Pantone codes, like 123 Athletic Gold, 289 Navy Blue. Expand pattern fills. This is a little bit of a, of a tricky one, but Best way to explain this is let's say you had an oval and in Adobe Illustrator, you can create an array pattern where maybe you have a bunch of hearts and you can fix the hearts um, around the perimeter of that oval. And as you reposition the heart and scale it up or down, the, the hearts move around. The spacing might change as it gets bigger, might get smaller. So those, those, those hearts are kind of uh, set up as um, interactive objects. And so if you put that in a graphic and somebody sizes the graphic up, the hearts might change position. So there's a function in, in Illustrator that says expand and it locks the hearts. And so the hearts can't move around anymore. And so you have to expand it and it's a feature in Illustrator. I think it's kind of an unusual thing to have happen, but it's, it's a good thing to know about. Um, when you're sending a bitmap file, you really should be sending a file that is a PNG file that has the background knocked out. One of the challenges of uh, JPEG files is JPEGs don't support transparency. 
And so the background is always going to be white. And so we don't want that white background. We want a transparent background. So by saving your files as a PNG file, um, you'll have, it won't, it won't take a JPEG and converting it to a PNG is not going to knock the white background out. But if you're creating artwork, um, say in Canva or another program, when you save it, you want to save it as an SVG or a PNG with a trans transparent background so that the color shows through. So really important. And then resolution, we could do a whole class on resolution. But resolution, 300 DPI is, is what they're recommending. But you can have a 300 DPI bitmap and still have a very poor quality image. It's, it's truly based on the quality of the image. And higher DPI at smaller sizes means if you had like a 600 DPI file and it was at 100%, but then you doubled the size, then it's going to be 300 DPI. So small size isn't necessarily a problem if it's high DPI. Where it's really bad is where you have a small size file at low DPI. And I think the best thing to do when you're, anytime you're in doubt about the quality of your, your source artwork is to print it. If you've got an inkjet printer at home, just print it. If it prints bad, it's going to make a bad transfer. And one of the things that I love about Supercolor is that they will work with you to fix um, problems in your artwork. You know, they have a whole team, literally a whole team that just pre-flights the artwork, figures out what's wrong. Sometimes they'll need some input from you. Sometimes they can just do it on their end. You never have to even know about it. They have all kinds of wonderful tools that they use. And to me, that's one of the, the best reasons to order from Supercolor is because they just handle the artwork. Having a company that can really understand artwork and that, you know, accepts that clients don't necessarily speak the same artwork language and they'll just fix it for you, I think is a, a, a really fantastic thing. Thank you so much for coming, hanging out with me today. 